groups um, from an apiary, which is this one here, all the way through to an English overgrown secret garden, and they were absolutely phenomenal at 1.5 million pound. Everything was included, everything was fit out, and it was just the bee's knees. We still have, to date, 14 different landscape rooms. The same pH variation levels on these seed and grasses. We still have a water garden, we still have a gr plant growing room. We still have a piece of equipment from America, which is the first of its kind, and we did it on a budget of so, how do we do that? You obviously cover it out, yes, but without maintaining uh, the kind of scale of cost, you can actually pare it down. So we, we lessened the scale of plants that were going on because a full grown plant has a different cost to a medium and a small. And what we did do was not lose any of the biodiversity requirements set out by the planners. And we scaled it across the roofs and we reduced the top levels of soil. They were allocated at 200 millimetres from the outset, but actually for seed and grass, seed and grass can grow in an 80 millimetre depth, max minimum. So we reduced the depth of the soil from 200 to 80 millimetres. Who's going to notice? Could it be built back up to 200 millimetres? Yes, because structurally we left the structure to allow it. So should the landscape school wish to experiment with one of these roofs going back up to 200 millimetres, they can bring the soil up and have it put on there at their own expense, at the development of the roofs, at the use of them going forward. So we did not reduce the scope, complexity of it, but we did reduce the day one fit out. We're still flexible to change. And we kept the flexibility. That's value engineering at its best. That's scope creep at its best, but value engineering. And so I guess you can balance it down, you know, and this is this is a huge success story for the University of Greenwich. This then went on and as we were developing it through, yeah, I knew it was scope creep. My boss knew it was scope creep. We all knew what we were doing, but we knew we had to reach the target at the end. And the Landscape School of Architecture knew that they did not have 1.5 million pounds unless they wished to fund it. This was not in our budget. And they knew quite openly and honest that they had to achieve the result down to 400,000 pounds. They got it down to about six, 700 with saying to me, we can't cut anything out, we can't cut anything more out. And I said to them, let us go away and have a look at it as a team and we'll come back to you. And we came back to them and said, we've reduced the soil gets, oh no, 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 you can't. But on day one, guess what they bought into? All right, we could take out that garden in its entirety. We'd lose our biodiversity and we'd have just a bare patch of concrete. What was your preference? Okay, take the soil down. They signed it off. Scope pre is best and value engineering successful. I would say successful. You tell, you tell me when you go visit the roof one day. Um, and, and, and this also was a Briam innovation credit because you could, we could just put grass on the roof, that's what we said we were going to do. Briam tick the box, it was grass on the roof for Briam. That gave us that one credit. The only other way we could get another credit out of Briam is to say that we are the only roof of its kind in the world to have a teaching and learning landscape roof such as this. And so we did. We submitted a Briam innovation credit, we were awarded it. And we are now the only kind of roof of its kind at this point in time in the world that is a teaching and learning landscape in the Brown Innovation Institute. So, MEP, BIM, this will be your future. Um, it is still a bit of an unknown entity. We used a 3D record model and our structural engineers produced it, and the subcontractor to Osborne built in a flash detection system for all of the MEP services. So you can see all the duct work that actually they built into the building as we've gone through. This then becomes a resource for the University of Greenwich. Now you ask Laura, she's probably, the, she's a new arrival to the University of Greenwich, which is fantastic. She's probably the only young person in the entire facility management department that understands how to use BIM and how she then picks this model up and develops it in the FM with a, within a structural we her challenge going forward. Um, because she, her and I are probably the only two that really know what we're doing in 3D Rebel. So we have this resource for the FM department to use and how they then build on that or utilise that is for them to develop as we go forward. Project program. Well, we were recently issued one last week, um, which shows us finishing in mid-July. And uh, we're going through it at the moment with comments for it being returned. You know, uh, we have a program meeting tomorrow morning, of which I will take all of my fit out contractors to. I will sit them down at the table with Osborne. We will have a clear and open discussion about their needs and their needs, and then we will design a way forward together. 
risk register. This is one very early on in the job. So 09, I won't be giving you one currently. <laughs> Steering group get that. But you can see for the we also give it and issue it to um, the contractors so that they can buy into the risk as well. Because uh, that's the open book process that we would like to have with them. And uh, we also do that, I suppose, so that they know where we're coming from as a client and they can try and help mitigate some of the risks. But obviously, it doesn't include the figures uh, that we have in terms of monetary cost. And then we currently have just taken on a marketing consultant because the University of Greenwich. Um, marketing a building like this is a new entity for our marketing department here. So we've taken a specialist who knows what they're doing and brought them on board so that you should see a lot more about the building in the public realm <coughs> in the future. Because that's one way of certainly getting prospective students in to show that we've made an investment such as this and we've been academic about it, how we've approached it, the process of it, and that hopefully it's a successful building for everyone. Was, the, was there any private investment in the occupying the land or the building works? Private investment, do you mean did somebody give us funding? Yeah. To date, we have not received Nothing. any. No, it would be really nice if um, a donor wanted to come forward and say, actually, I'd like the lecture theatre named after me. Um, our alumni association at the moment is looking at funding for some study rooms in the library, and if that happens, that might happen in the next couple of weeks. But that's the rest of it has been purely university money. The university, from, the land, or the, you own the land and the building. Yep, this is our only owned building in Greenwich because the Old Royal Naval College will be ranked on a hundred and something year lease. And same for Hamilton House, we rent it. And the Daniel Defoe Hall, we will be renting for the next 35 years and then we'll pay a pound for the same own the land. Own but a building on a reversion. Have you um, subsequently done in the bit out work for the um, retail space from us? For the retail? Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we haven't signed a contract as yet, but um, we, we're, we've been in negotiation now, you know, making sure they understand what they're getting. Because the building comes with a heap of output requirements, so if they're a print shop as well as an art shop, they need to know what kind of equipment they can bring in because we impose these requirements on them for free and for sustainable. It's an art shop, but they also are looking at bringing in a printer, so we're just checking at the moment the heat output requirements. So before we sign the contract and get into something where they expect something and we expect something different, we're assessing their heat output requirements of the machine that they'd like to bring with them. The one retail space. Right. And they, they're looking to move in. Uh yeah, ready for us in same. September. Yes, yeah, same thing. But they're, they're, you know, they're fairly easy going about it because they already have their shop and they know what they're doing, so we're just assessing their heat up at the front. The cafe will be run as the same as the cafe providers downstairs. I think it's back to story. And they're on a leasing agreement with the university, so they're yeah. going to move in, which means it's a university cafe. We provide it, we build it, we fit it out, and then they come in and lease it. Well, assuming that's got to be ready for students. Yeah. 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 You know, you've got to have toilet roll holders. Yeah. As exciting as it sounds. You know, they need to be installed on the wall, on the cubicle, ready to go on day one. Yeah. Who's doing the Who's doing snagging? Snagging. snagging. So this, uh, at the moment, this is part of our soft landing program. We have a process where we're snagging as we go, and then Osborne will be on site for a period of months afterwards with um, SES, our subcontractor, because most of the snag will predominantly, other than aesthetic and kind of general architectural ones, it'll be mechanical engineering because, you know, they have time the lights to come on at certain times and you can bet your bottom dollar that the light will come on at 2am in the morning and it'll upset the neighbour and break them. You know, so this kind of teething will not happen and it just needs to be weeded out because it's all based on a building management system so it's run by the BMS. So actually, we've got a BMS expert joining so, us. So Osborne will fall into that and the subcontractors will sign yeah. up for that? We did is that. There a term? Is there a term? Is there a 12 month term or is it not a term? Yeah, it's called seasonal commissioning. Yeah. And it was originally lasting for 14 months, but because they're a bit behind, we've given them a date for 12 months opposed to practical completion. So we'll have a full seasonal commissioning period where we've set out the roles and responsibilities for each month. So that's not like a traditional defect period then? No, no. it's different. The defects period will be 12 months. Yeah. For the land spec school, know about the defects period. Yeah. They know that they can't dig up a tree and move it onto another roof. Why? Uh, no, 
But I mean, the landscape architects, right? Uh, so, what happens in the insulation builder? You have your concrete frame, you have your insulation waterproofing layer. How many different subcontractors do you think you have building up the rooms? Then you have the guys who bring on the insulation. So what you try and do in any position like this is you realise that the frame is built by one contractor, the waterproofing is done by another contractor, then the insulation and all the soil and planting is then built by the third contractor. So you, if the landscapes will go in and dig up the tree and move it to another location, what's the risk that they dig through the waterproof membrane? Probably quite high, yeah? So for the first 12 months, the university signed up to we will not move any major planting. We will just accept the roofs as they are, let it go for the first 12 months, and then after 12 months, if you damage the waterproofing membrane because of pitchfork through the roof, through the insulation, we don't have to worry about who's to blame. We know it's our own. Just go back to that seasonal commission. Um, are, they, are they on site at all time? Or how, how does it it's a wasp problem? If you've got problems with your 12 month defects, you bring them up and they've had to come and deal with it anyway. So yeah, you have call out periods, you have call out allocations, and. Um, What's the key difference between seasonal commissioning and a 12 month defect period? I don't see well, 12 month defect period is if something goes wrong. Yeah. Right? So that's what seasonal seasonal commissioning is they you can balance your boilers. So you have four boilers in the boiler house, right. three will be working at all times, and in the event of one of those failing, then the next one will pick up, won't you? Yeah, yeah. Right? And your BMS will intelligently say, actually, this boiler's failing, swap it over to the next one, and then the building will continue to run as yeah. normal. But this boiler then needs checking because it's not going to start up the next morning. Right. So that might not be picked so they up. They can't charge you, basically. So you set out a series of tasks that they need to come and review on a monthly basis. Right. So each month they'll come and check the balance of the boilers and that it's working. And also, that keeps your energy efficiencies down because one boiler is working hard yakka and the other three aren't really doing much, you've got to balance it out so that you are, might have one as a backup and three more moderate. So that actually the energy output, it's like accelerating in a car. If you put your foot down, you're going to burn more petrol than what you are as if you're just cruising along. It's the same principle for running an entire building. If one boiler's working over time and the other three aren't doing much, then you haven't got the right balance. So this actually takes quite a lot of finicky tweaking and that's for 12 months. 12 months, 12 yeah. Months. A whole season because spring, summer, winter. Oh. Season. Is that not like um, promising in the deep periods after? Is it? Uh, you it no, because they should. Like It's like the fire alarms you were saying before. They set up the fire alarm so that it works, but if uh, a smoke detector doesn't work because it's faulty from the manufacturer, this would be a defect. But if actually the system's not balancing it, you can't actually walk to the other end of the building in four minutes, then on that monthly rotation, our FM would say, could you increase that to five minutes so I can actually make it to the other side of the building because I'm sitting here in the reception desk and the alarm's gone off through there. I've actually realised I can't get there in five, four minutes, so I need five. That's seasonal commissioning. It's that tweaking to refine the system so that everybody can do the way it works. And that just set up so yeah. Would that extend to kind of like where you mentioned earlier about, you know, the veterans using equipment and this and stuff like that? Would it extend that yeah. far or is it more literally just about, you know, plant? Yeah, plant within the building. No, so you're right, because actually, if you're accepting that process from the main contractor and the subcontractor about how the building should run, then you should consider that for how the whole building will operate. And yeah, the lecturer probably walking in will want to know why is this different, how is that? So we've got to work through that. We've allocated project management and training days into all of our subcontractor packages. Because they will need to spend time training our staff, FM. You have enough staff time to so if it was seasonal commission, is that part of the soft hands program? We have from the outset of the engagement of the mechanical electrical plumbing and the key subcontractor, we set out for them to give us a seasonal commissioning program and we sign them up to that with a sum of money in the contract and it is considered as part of the soft landings. But prior to that, what we're doing at the moment in February this coming month is we're having a series of familiarisation workshops. So yes, we've had the user groups who have been involved in the building the whole way through, but our IT department, including the head of IT, will attend the site, sit down at the meeting table with our subcontractor, 
and his data payment guy, and his conduit guy, and his power electrician, who's running all of the seminar rooms. We will take the typology of one room, and then fully understand how the system runs, where the rises are, and they're having familiarization workshops, so that they can walk away saying, I actually know how the building works. If I want to add some more cabling into the building, I know which riser to go to, and where to get it from my server room to feed it through. So that when we start feeding out the building, the equipment that they're purchasing, anything additional, they have an understanding in their head about how the building operates before they fit their own equipment out, like the wireless access points. Is um, your contingency plan this building, yeah? If it all went wrong, mm -hmm. there's a, a disaster in the Yep. So, yep, because this could foreseeably happen. No. So, this is it, this is where we're sitting now, is it? Yep. So, would you have just one contingency plan, or would you have a couple? So a couple depend on how bad the problem was. Yeah. If the building was like inhabitable, then we'd have to stay here. But yeah. if it was just that your um, some of your electrical equipment, like the electric filters weren't up and running, then I suppose you just have different uh, timetables for programs and yeah. stuff. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So who would you need to get on board to make sure that that worked? Head of departments, lecturers themselves. Right. Um, just. Anyone who does a general planning of the files as well. Yep. Space management unit. Yeah. Space management unit. We have a monthly report and an update to space management unit. They have a drop dead date of which they have given us that if, if we foresee that it will not be open on that date, that we say to them on that date, please enable contingency plan number one. Please enable contingency plan number two. Do they know what the contingency plans are? They do. Do the library staff know? Yes. Do the architecture staff know? They should do it there, you can remember tells them. But yeah. Does everybody have an understanding? Yeah. I mean, the worst thing you can possibly do as a project manager is say, we don't have a business. <laughs> because then you're not planning and you're not using your risk register. So we have two. And uh, I'm hoping we don't have to use them. But you know, you can't foresee like the Daniel Defoe Hall just before Christmas, the building next to us, which is run by Wilmot Dixon had a flood in their basement and it creeped into our basement because we have an energy centre between us. So the energy centre got filled with two and a half metres of water, which meant all the boilers, electric, electrical distribution, plumbing, pipe work. When water fills the room, everything that's sitting on the floor rises or gets pushed to the top, which then to all the pipe work, the insulation, you name it. That entire boiler room now needs to be stripped out and rehoused before the students occupy the building in September. And these things aren't the same. It's not our leak. Mm -hmm. It was the building next door's leak. And so it wasn't sealed up. You're right. The connection between the rooms weren't fire sealed yet because they had that wasn't in the program to have had done it. But they had a leak, and guess when the leak happened? Friday night. Guess when they discovered it? Monday morning. When was that? As well, sorry. That. Before Christmas. Uh, so, so then what happens is all your insurers come in. You need to deal with all of this as a completely separate project. You keep your own project trying to move forward. But this is a design of a contract for us. So for me, it's, it's completely out of our hands because we're a client that's down the chain. Does so it just pay money on your, on your um, contingency? So say if those boilers, it took so many weeks for the insurance company to pull everything around and look at it, that you could take pictures of it, put some money, get it done, and then worry about paying it back later so that the work was done, or is it always... It's up to the contractor in that one to do. So if it was... Yeah, if it was, yeah, if it was another job and it was a different contract, then you would probably... The client would make a decision and deal with it. But in that position, I'm a client that is about five down the chain. So me as the client is the leasee of the building. Yeah. There is the funders. The main funders of the job to assign all the responsibility over to the property construction company. That property construction company assigns it to their contractor. The contractor then engages all of the architects and design consultants, yeah. so they are novated, and it's therefore the contractor and the project manager's responsibility of the project management the property company. Yeah, so, who's insurance How many insurances do you think you have on a building? How many, how many insurances do you think you have on a building? Every consultant has their own PI insurance. The client has, we have a couple of insurances. We have one for the site, 
although we don't own it, we've given it over to Osborne to manage, we still have insurance on that area because if something were to happen um, to Osborne and they fell or something didn't work, we would still then need to get another contractor in to finish the job. I mean, these are worst case scenarios and we really don't, we don't get there. Um, in that instance, Wilmot Dixon, the contractor who is running that site, their insurance will cover it. But in the first instance, to get everything up and running, our contractor's insurance will need to deal with it immediately and assess with their insurers so they'll need to work together to achieve it. Bonds? Yep, we have a bond on this project. With Osborne or with the. With Osborne? Yep. And they have them then, then I suppose, string them down the chain? Yeah, okay. Just a quick one do you have this X amount of new staff being employed because of the size increase? You mean in the... In terms of the running the building? Well, I was employed. No, I mean once it's up and running. Uh, is yeah. As in, like, growing a lot in terms of the amount of staff that's going to be involved, can't determine how it's actually going to No, 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 no. This, this, it's a good point, actually. Um, the scale of the building, because we're moving schools over and kind of closing down elements here, the cafe staff will probably need to increase. They'll have to have new staff. Um, in terms of facilities management, um, I'm not sure what their plan is of the soft services manager who runs in central services all the campuses, but Laura um, has been brought on to make sure, because previously the deputy position was there but it wasn't filled, and so Laura has definitely been an addition. Um, we've got an m and services manager on Greenwich campus who's been an addition in the last year. Because these things are needed as you're developing it. And it's not a last minute addition, it's yes. like a now, or last year edition because or actually they need to know what's happening and I'm just sure we've got to pick this. This building's so complex you won't pick it up in a couple of weeks. I mean we're talking about cleaners and yeah. you know the, the And we already have service contracts in place, so we will stretch those service contracts. Security guards, we already have security guards so in place. Improve, stretched. Yeah. 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 So you're keeping the same contracts running because they've probably got contract dates that are going to go yeah. past so okay. And you make sure that those contracts are also involved. So we, to date, had three meetings with our cleaners. Why? Because they might not be big enough to actually go from this campus to that one. That might push them too far, won't it? Why else would you meet with a group? Why, why would you meet with the cleaners if you're building a new building? She was a full of issues. Exactly. Exactly. Um, also, a surface finish in this building is concrete. <coughs> Where else do we have surface concrete? Where else do we have fair face concrete in the University of uh, Greenwich? No way. Correct. Right. So what are you doing? Applying yeah, new methodology of cleaning. Where else do we have exposed services in the entire building? Like the image I showed you here. This is pretty much what you'll see. The lighting rafts will run through. You'll see the exposed services. We have a ceiling in here. How do cleaners know how to clean exposed services? So part training. Teaching. Ask them. Show them. Take them inside. Give them a flame rubber. Get their blame. Cool. Have I answered your questions? I think I've the rouse skirted around it. So they don't give the most perfect answer. I well, expect it's the soft landings. They very definitely got the answer to soft landings. <laughs> Adele was briefed to take out the slide on stakeholders and what yeah. was the other one? And uh, my move program. Yeah, the migration program so that you couldn't actually lift oh. and shift that. But you managed to successfully cajole her into answering a lot of questions about soft landings. Huge amount of information to take on board. And I would just suggest you think about everything she's told you. Not just relative to this project, but relative to your other learning. Some of you are doing FM, some of you have already done FM. So many key learning points in there. And this was not simply just a presentation. This was a huge value to you all in terms of extra over. I just want to add a couple of things because our construction world is supposed to be about collaborative learning. That's what we do, mm -hmm. we very much do that. We are constantly meeting, reference all sorts of strange and even wonderful topics, not to do with lecturing, nor um, to do with Stockholm Street. 
We are both party to being working groups. Adele, Adele writes things that I then end up betting. It's a very joined up world, lots of collaborative working. Some of you participated in the Student Challenge last year. As Adele mentioned, Osborne's actually not only played within that scenario, but they actually contributed financially. Again, collaborative working. We actually have, and it didn't take much persuasion from me to Adele, but we actually have a number of second year students who will be on placement as part of this project across the summer. So we are using and exploiting this project in every possible way. Thank you for your contributions and your questions. I'll move this end. Shame on the person who asked who's the contractor. There's a website out there. If you were going to meet a client, to get a brief, reference a potential project, you do your homework. I suggest you do a little bit of homework. The information is there. There's a plethora of information out there on Stockwell Street. You could have then probed Adele for more of the answers to the real questions. Okay. Any comments, questions, anything you need to know before we go? Will we get this? You will get everything. You will get. You will get the presentation and you'll get a copy of the video. Yeah. And if you are finally, I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavours and your career.